Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles in more ways than one. By now you've probably already heard the news that I am finally available as a playable captain in World of Warships. If you don't already have me, all you have to do is click the link down below in the video description which will take you to the relevant article on your regional World of Warships portal where you can activate the mission which will unlock me as a captain for your British warships once you've earned 10,000 base experience. I understand, of course, that several of you are less than happy that you cannot have the mighty Admiral Jingles commanding warships of lesser nations. I'm afraid that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Or is it? Morning, men. Starboard 10. Round the boy and back again. What dark sorcery is this? That's quite clearly a destroyer of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Jingles, have you colonised Japan now? Well, sort of, yes, and sort of, no. You see, while you can't actually put me physically in command of anything other than the British warship, once you've unlocked me, all you have to do is go to your in-game voice settings and select the Mighty Jingles from the available list of national voiceover mods, and you can have me barking out orders and getting stuff wrong, regardless of the nationality of the ship that you happen to be sailing. So even all of you weebs, like Spitfire X-250 here in the Japanese Tier 9 gunboat destroyer, the Kitakaze, can enjoy the dubious pleasure of having me telling them what to do and getting things wrong in the heat of battle. What do you mean getting things wrong, Jingles? Ah, well, that's the thing, isn't it? Thanks to everybody who supported the hashtag Make Jingles Crap Again movement. <laughs> well, you know what? No spoilers. I mean, most of you probably know what to expect by now. But we'll just wait for it to happen. I think that's probably the most fun way of doing it. I mean, depending on which Twitch streams you've been watching, the cat's probably out of the bag by now. But let's just say it's pretty common knowledge that I am known for occasionally, every now and then, once in a blue moon, misidentifying the odd ship or tank here and there. Ooh, Chung Mu, Pan Asian Tier 9 destroyer. In my opinion, way better than the Pan Asian Tier 10 destroyer, the Yu Yang. A formidable opponent. But the Kitikazi can take it in a gunfight. The issue, of course, is what about his friends? While they appear to be occupied, Chung Mu gave his position away and is continuing to give his position away by shooting at the Mogador. The Mogador's French, doesn't have a smokescreen generator, so they're probably going to keep shooting at the Mogador. So, yeah, what's the worst that could... Oh shit, they're not just shooting at the Mogador! <laughs> not quite, no. Alright, slight miscalculation there, but he had an exit strategy in case it all went wrong. Not just the smoke generator, but also the island here, just in case somebody on the enemy team decided to pop a radar. So, he lost a little health, but the Chung Mu lost a lot more. It's all good. The Chung Mu just learned the hard way that you don't rush forward right at the start of a battle in a destroyer and immediately start blazing away with your guns at the first thing that you see, unless you either have a rock-solid exit strategy, like Spitfire did, or you know for a fact that you're not about to come under fire from half of the enemy fleet. Well, I say he learned it the hard way. The fact that he's still doing it in a Tier 9 destroyer is probably a fairly solid indicator that he's never really going to learn not to do that. Spitfire popping his torpedo reload booster there. The Kitakazi is very much a gunboat. It has lots and lots and lots of 100mm guns. And it only has the one torpedo launcher, but it is a big torpedo launcher that can put six torpedoes in the water at once. And for those opportunities when you absolutely definitely have to try to be the USS Benham, it has the torpedo reload booster, which allows you to put another six torpedoes into the water very, very quickly. Although it does have quite a long cooldown. This ship very much relies on its guns rather than its torpedoes, but don't discount the torpedoes because because they do hit kind of hard. I mean, the Alsace over there has 44% torpedo damage reduction, and that torpedo still clobbered him with only one hit for 14,000 damage. But it's the guns. Eight 100mm rifles with a terrifying, as you can see, rate of fire. Now, because they're only 100mm guns, when these ships were first introduced, the high explosive shells were such low calibre that you often had to switch to armour piercing shells to penetrate the armour of destroyers the same tier as you. And the high explosive shells were all but useless other than for starting fires against cruisers and battleships, and you could only really do consistent damage with your armour piercing, providing the target wasn't angled. 
So this meant that you either had to invest in the IFHE skill or actually think about what you were doing when you were playing an Akazuki, a Kitakazi, or a Harugamo, and of course, people don't like having to think about what they're doing. So Wargaming gave Japanese destroyers, armed with 100mm guns, increased high explosive armor penetration. Which meant, of course, that all of those Akazuki, Kitakazi, and Harugamo captains who had invested points in the IFHE skill suddenly had guns that could melt through the 32mm armour plating on battleships like the Alsace over there. Which is why Spitfire was almost certainly rubbing his hands in glee when he realised that he had an Alsace to shoot at from the safety and concealment of the island over there. Now he's creeping up on the lion. His torpedoes are almost ready to go, as is his torpedo reload booster. Torpedoes to start and speaking of torpedoes... Well, the lion didn't launch those which almost certainly means that the enemy Z-46, and yep, there he is. I mean, the smoke screen was a bit of a giveaway as well. And it's here that we see Spitfire suddenly switch to widespread torpedoes. It's a bit ambitious, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you put six torpedoes into the water at once, but if you want to hit the lion, because he's reversing and moving very slowly and predictably, surely you would go for the narrow spread. And yeah, if the lion was the only target that he was hoping to hit with the torpedoes, that would make sense, but he's on a bit of a fishing expedition. He's hoping to catch the Z-46 as well. well that didn't completely suck. Some possibly extremely sarcastic words of encouragement there from a captain on the enemy team, also delivered in my voice, which is what will happen if you activate me, once you've unlocked me at least, as your national voiceover mod. The lion over there is in all kinds of trouble. He can't possibly turn, otherwise he's going to get broadside to a Georgia's 18-inch guns. But the Georgia has failed to take into account the extremely angry smoke screen right behind the Lion over there. And he's just running at the Z-46's torpedoes. And that, of course, has given the Lion a fighting chance against the Georgia, and he wastes no time whatsoever in exploiting it. Now, this could be a little risky here. But we definitely don't want that lion to either start healing or escape entirely. So Spitfire decides it's definitely worth the risk. Which means this is probably the part you've all been waiting for. We've sunk an allied destroyer. Really, Jingles? Because <laughs> it kind of looked like an enemy battleship to everybody else. Uh, you see, this is the kind of thing that was really missing from the first iteration of the Captain Jingles voice pack because I'm nothing if not famous for occasionally getting things wrong. Occasionally, you know, not all the time. It's not like I make a habit out of it or anything. <laughs> and originally, all I wanted to do was to mix up some of the voice lines. When you spot an enemy destroyer, Jingles might say, we've spotted an enemy destroyer, cruiser, battleship, or aircraft carrier. You know, things like that. Well, Wargaming kind of had a bit of a hold my beer moment. <laughs> And to be honest, I kind of like it. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I can't honestly say I'm unhappy with the results. So happy I'm going to shut up now and let my in-game voice give you the commentary for the next few seconds. Smoke generator started. We've destroyed an allied battleship. We've sunk an ally, cruise box screen set. Engine boost deactivated. So, multiple points of contention there. In fact, I think that the only thing that I got right in that brief interlude was the fact that the Izumo was a battleship. Other than that, pretty much working as intended. <laughs> oh, Z46 managed to get some torpedoes away. Uh, just a minor nudge on the throttle should be enough. Careful not to stray outside of the smoke screen. No, we're all good. Although avoiding the torpedoes did momentarily force Spitfire to leave the cap circle, so he's just cautiously backing up again while having himself some happy, happy farming time on the Georgia and the John Bart over there. Oh, the Georgia just took a big hit from something. Uh, not Spitfire, of course. I mean, I say happy, happy farming time, and I'm sure he'd much rather be shooting the John Bart because of the 32mm plating. But he couldn't stay inside the smoke and the cap circle and hit the Jean Bart from where he was, so he had to make do with the Georgia. The Georgia's down now, taken out by the friendly Lion, who's bow tanking both of them. 
and actually in a pretty good position because he can't be shot at by the Masashi over there. And he's not doing it alone, of course. Both the Georgia and the Jean Bart were exposing themselves to crossfire from over here. While the Lion is just sitting there taking it and doing a remarkably good job. He's actually going to finish this encounter, not this battle, but this encounter with, I think, 2.5 million damage tanked. And is going to be the source of so much salt from some of the enemy players. Ah, Buffalo. Radar cruiser. Yeah. It'd be really nice if that thing was either dead or forced to run away. And not just for Spitfire's benefit, the friendly Mogador up to the north can't really do anything with that buffalo there. And if not for the buffalo, the Mogador would be in a great position to sweep around to the north and catch the enemy team in a crossfire. Oh, hello. Is that a smokescreen I see? I'm pretty sure there was a Masashi there a moment ago, and Masashis don't come with smokescreen generators. Do you perhaps think that maybe, just maybe, that's where the enemy Uteloy is? Widespread torpedo time. Torpedo reload booster? Is he going to go for it or is he going to rely on the six torpedoes? I think it would make sense to pump another six. Yeah, he's going for it. He's using the torpedo reload booster. Given the area that that smokescreen covers, it's, it's not entirely surprising that he's going to double down on his bet. Question is, can he do it in time to save the Iowa who is giving broadside to the Masashi? Actually, if you look at the torpedoes that just, well, one of them hit the Iowa, they came from straight ahead of the Iowa, not from the smokescreen where Spitfire is gambling the Uteloy is, which must mean that the Iowa is facing in that direction in order to avoid Benham torpedoes. Speaking of which, two torpedoes on the Masashi, can we get a third? Um, yes, just not on the Masashi. Yes, that's right, Jingles. You've sunk an Allied aircraft carrier. That would be the world-famous Japanese Udali class aircraft carrier. Well done. Now shut up and see if you can sink the equally world-famous American Masashi class destroyer. Um, oh, I don't know. Maybe. Did he set a fire? He did not set a fire. Somebody else is going to have to finish off the Masashi. The lion is still alive. He's been having a great game. He fought the Jean Bart and the Georgia to a standstill. He's still fighting the Jean Bart and he's just sunk the Masashi. <laughs> have a medal. In fact, have two, because they're quite small. Spitfire's got his sights set on that Jean Bart now, of course, because, well, you know, French battleship, 32mm plating. Om nom 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 nom. Uh, this is one of the downsides, of course, of the Kitakaze. I mean, it has an engine boost and he is using it, but it's not a particularly fast destroyer. And the Jean Bart can be an extremely fast battleship. He is in range though, he just has to clear line of sight. Smoke ready to go? Yep, smoke is ready to go. Now if you could pop that smoke screen in a line between the Jean Bart and the Lion, the Lion is probably sufficiently far away that he could fire through the smoke without being spotted as well. And even if Spitfire isn't specifically planning to do that, he's more or less in a straight line between the Lion and the Jean Bart anyway. So the Lion should be able to take advantage of any smoke screen that Spitfire drops in the next minute or so. But I think that before Spitfire commits there are a couple of things that he wants to know. He doesn't really need to worry about the Buffalo, he's up to the north being chased by an Arsace and a Mogador. But the enemy team do still have a Missouri. And the Missouri has radar too. Plus, you don't just want to get in range of the Jean Bart, stop, pop smoke and start shooting at him, because the Jean Bart can haul ass and get out of range of your guns. Oh, there's the Missouri, so that answers that question. If you're going to start shooting at the Jean Bart, you need to be as close as you possibly can, ideally with inside the cap circle, before you slow, pop your smoke and start unloading with these 100mm guns to maximise the amount of time that you have guns on target. Now would be a pretty good time. He's inside the cap circle, he's popped smoke, he's slowing, he's too far away to be radared by either the Missouri or the Buffalo. He's capping, the Jean Bart has just left the cap circle and he's going to be under fire for so long at this kind of range that there is absolutely no way, no way whatsoever he's going to survive this encounter, even if he pops a heel. The amount of fire coming in not just from Spitfire, although the amount of fire coming in from Spitfire alone is terrifying enough, but he's not the only one shooting at him. He's on fire, he's burning. He's just getting pummeled into oblivion. It's just a question of who's going to claim the kill. 
Although it looks like the friendly Jean Bart is going for a ram on the Missouri. If he thinks he's about to die anyway, that wouldn't be a terrible trade. There's the high caliber award. And there's the kill and the Kraken. We've destroyed an allied battleship. Go home, Jingles, you're drunk. <laughs> I love that they've done this. And yet, uh, the Missouri and the friendly Jean Bart have rammed each other. That just leaves the Buffalo, who's right up there to the north, and thanks to an expertly timed radar from the friendly Buffalo. We're winning. Try not to do anything stupid. Thank you for those kind words of encouragement, Jingles. We will do our best to try to not disappoint you. But yes, thanks to an expertly timed radar from the friendly Buffalo, there's the enemy Bennett who is zigging and zagging and bobbing and weaving like a man possessed and doing a remarkably good job of it. That radar's not going to last forever. Yep, it's expired. The Benham's made it out of there and he is definitely going to make a fight of this. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say that the odds are in the Benham's favour. They're definitely not, but, well, followers of this channel won't have to cast their memories back too far to remember what a Benham that's being pursued is capable of doing when it's in the hands of a decent player. 16 torpedo launchers, a very short reload, that ship can put 32 torpedoes in the water at the same time. And if you're belting after him at full speed, those torpedoes can be coming at you at a combined approach speed of around 100 knots, which does not leave you an awful lot of time to get out of the way. And as we've already stated, the Benham has a lot of torpedoes. When the Benham decides to throw a torpedo party, Everybody's invited. Spitfire's probably safe, but the Alsace and the Buffalo, because if you look at the map, they're right next to each other, and yep, the Benham has unloaded at the Alsace and the Buffalo. Okay, well, technically, because he's not stupid, and he knows the Buffalo with its radar is the bigger threat, he's unloaded his torpedoes at the Buffalo, and by association, the Alsace. He's actually going to miss the Alsace, but he's going to hit the Buffalo. The friendly buffalo has a brief blaze of glory, taking out the enemy buffalo, which is of course great news for Spitfire, but the torpedo fired by the Benham that struck that buffalo on the bow did finish him off with the flooding. So that's great news for the Benham. He's definitely still in with a solid chance of pulling a victory out here. The odds are not great, as long as he doesn't get detected. The problem, of course, is that for the Benham to empty all 16 of its torpedoes into the water at the same time it has to do an awful lot of ducking and weaving from side to side and that slows you down which allowed Spitfire to get close enough to spot him and the rest is history. So jolly good show Spitfire old chap, remarkably appropriate choice of name for somebody commanding a Japanese gunboat voiced by none other than the mighty me. Do keep up the good work colonizing the lesser navies of the world and as they say in the funny pages Toodle pip, cheerio, and I'll catch you next time.